Howdy, everybody. I'm out here in the amphitheater. Before we jump into this morning's online talk, I just wanted to give a shout out of thanks, especially to Karen and Cindy and Linda and Marcy and Tomas and Marcio for Mauricio for helping out uh, this week, uh, helping to get the amphitheater uh, ready, spraying and weeding and putting flowers in the ground. So big thanks to you guys. If you haven't heard already, our plan is to gather again uh, as a worship community on the 21st. We'll be meeting, weather permitting, uh, outside in the amphitheater and in the picnic area so you can do whatever social distancing that you're comfortable with or your health requires and hope to see you uh, then for sure, if not sooner. Earlier in the week when some of the gals were here to, the weather was a little different than it is right now and they were here to help me uh, plant flowers. I told them because I had some other things actually I, w I wanted to do. I thought, well, I'll just give them the flowers and say, go for it, ladies, and I did. I said, just plant them any way you like, wherever you want. And they said, there ain't no way. Uh, they said, you put them where you want them and we'll stick them in the ground. Now, they said that for a, a reason. There's this I don't know who started this nasty rumor, but some people think I'm kind of picky. And what they were afraid of is what all of us have as a, as a fear, really. And that is, um, how do you handle criticism? How do you handle it when other people disapprove of you? And that's actually what we want to talk about here this um, morning, or whenever you're watching this. Uh, what does God have to say about receiving and receiving well, when to receive, when not to receive, uh, words of critique or correction or rebuke or criticism. So let's get inside. We are in the last of a series that uh, we titled Insomnia, not uh, original with us, but uh, helpful to think about those things that keep us up at night. This series began on the heels of spending almost three months in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. We will, beginning next week, Lord willing, uh, start a new study in the New Testament book of 1 Peter. But for today, uh, one last time in this series on the things that kind of haunt us, the things that trouble our, our mind and our emotions, that suck the joy out of life, that um, just drain us of, of life, keep us tossing and turning. And we looked at what does God have to say about those kinds of issues. We, we talked about the fear of death. We, we talked last week, Skyler did a great job talking about the, the fear of failure. We've looked at uh, a guilty conscience. We, we looked at small and large offenses that can lead to nursing a grudge, which is certainly uh, troubling to the soul. And, and uh, what we want to look at here today, and here's how we've said it over, well, for many decades now around here, uh, we want to look at what rents space out in our head, and that came from an old candid camera, one of the original punked and uh, what, what else do they call those shows? Uh, they, oh, pranks, the prank shows. So this was kind of the original of those. Uh, they were more um, kind-hearted back in the 60s and early 70s when that show ran. They'd always end after the person realized they were getting pranked with smile, you're on candid camera. And in one episode that I never uh, could forget and is where this renting space out in, in your head really took hold for me as sort of the go-to idiom for um, when you're really troubled, especially when it has to do with the words and actions of other people. Uh, they were in a grocery store and they had a little sign that said, we're not making change today. And people would be standing there and expecting their change from the cash they gave uh, the cashier, and they would look at them and go, oh, well, we're not making change today, and then most people would get kind of uh, indignant about it, but one guy j just kind of shrugged and started walking off, and they said, no, no, wait, come back here, sir. They go, um, isn't this troublesome to you or whatever? And he goes, I'm not going to rent any space out in my head for 69 cents. And so what is it that rent space out in your head. I know for some of us, it's the subject we want to talk about here today, is that is how do I handle criticism? 
How do I handle knowing that someone or some ones disapprove of me? I brought into the office, as has become my custom, some of the comic strips from Dilbert. And if you're not familiar with the comic strip, it focuses around the interactions of of people in, in an office environment, and it's really humorous and incredibly insightful into human nature. And in this particular one, reads like this, and I don't remember exactly which characters, nor do you care, but one said to another, your name came up in a meeting last night. I can't tell you what they said, but I stuck up for you. And that is just daggone funny. And I think all of us can relate to that, right? It's like, we want to know, like, what did they say? Who said it? Was it, was it Karen? Oh, I bet it was Karen. You know, she has no right to. And then on we go, renting space out in our, in our heads. And all of us, I think, can, can re relate to it, especially if you're one of those uh, people pleaser types, right? You know what a people pleaser is? Someone who gives a lot of importance to what other people are to pleasing other people. And... And that's not all misguided. I mean, not all people-pleasing is misguided. It's not wrong to want people to like you. It's, it's, it's not wrong to not want to unnecessarily displease others or disappoint others. And In fact, not only is it not wrong, it would be not human or to not have a human heart if you didn't have some empathetic feelings towards others. You would be uh, someone relationally cut off to have zero interest in other people liking you or e other people having positive emotions towards you or caring or being empathetic about how others feel. And it's like we're hardwired for it from, from infancy. And you can see this with a baby. You smile at a baby, and I have a, a, a grandbaby now, and there were times where, I mean, you smile and it impacts them. And t if you frowned, uh, in fact, uh, you know, just the, my tone of voice could... Could get, her, could get her crying. And that's one thing, though, I suppose, if you're an infant, but you're not meant to, for the rest of your life, uh, when someone frowns, to that, for that to become the master of you. And so I, I want to talk about, and mainly just from my own experience and my own approach, uh, how do you handle criticism in a in a healthy and a God-honoring way where you're able to kind of maintain perspective and, and, and really keep your, give your relationships the best chance of, of success and, and to keep you from getting defensive and angry or, or on the other hand, at the other extreme, uh, feeling overwhelmed or distracted, unable to sleep at night, renting space out in your head. And so um, that is especially a vulnerability have when criticism or disapproval uh, comes where we feel attacked or it just seems unfair or was unnecessarily and overly harsh. And, and un unfortunately, um, I can only relate to this kind of in a theoretical way because as a pastor, you're just, just loved by all. And I can't relate to criticism that's, that's harsh or unfair. And if you believe that, I've got some swamp land I think um, I'd be interested in cutting you a deal on. The truth is, as Abraham Lincoln said, and I had to learn this early in the ministry, you better get yourself, because um, you need to care about people. People matter to God. They should care about you. So you need to have a sensitive, sensitive hide, but you better have a thick sensitive hide. You're going to need it. We all are going to need it. Abraham Lincoln said it this way, you can please some of the people some of the time, all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can never please all the people all of the time. And that's just the truth. Uh, failure to appreciate that uh, and, uh, is deadly for someone who goes in, into the ministry. Um, there are many factors, of course, that play a role in, in the stats that were distilled by Barna, focused on the family in Fuller Seminary. And I'm just going to, for time's sake, tell you one, that in no small way um, has the criticism plays a role in this. 80% of pastors feel unqualified or discouraged in their role as pastor. And, and, and here's the reality. I, I, this is a, a Facebook little, I don't know if it's officially a meme, but I, it probably qualifies as one. 
Uh, we'll, we'll put it on the old crud. I didn't bring it up here. Shoot. We'll put it on the screen for you. Now pause that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, this was sent, uh, or someone posted it on Facebook, or sent, I think they sent it to me, but I didn't repost it. But it really does reflect reality for probably every pastor everywhere uh, during this pandemic and all that's associated with it. And if you look, uh, we'll put it on, the, you have it, right, for the screen? Why don't you put that up there? I'll just read a couple of them. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't open the church building yet. It's a huge risk. You are wrong if you do. It's all a big hoax, a conspiracy, a media frenzy. Read this article, this link. Don't be afraid. My wife, husband, dad, grandparent, uh, uncle, sister, niece just passed away from COVID-19. Here are the 25 things you need to do if you want to start meeting in your building. My family is going to stay home. Uh, for a while before coming back to church. We need to open the church building. I need to be there and see everyone. What are you waiting for? And <clears throat> what did Abraham Lincoln say? <laughs> it's just impossible to please everybody all the time. It's not an option open to those, uh, and not just, not just presidents like Abe Lincoln, and, and not just pastors, but it's a fool's errand for, for everyone to think that you can make everyone happy or approve of you or in a full of agreement or that somehow you'll be able to escape um, correction or criticism or rebuke. It is a fool's errand to think such. And so if you're a coach or a supervisor or a team captain or a Christian band leader, a committee member or a parent or a spouse or a co-worker or you're in a church home group or you have a sibling or you have friends or you've posted something on social media and you made the fatal mistake of reading the comments right which is why I'm really careful because I got bigger fish to fry uh, than throwing out a bunch of controversial and political uh, uh, posts that are just going to keep people from it's going to minimize or limit my potential uh, to speak into people's lives regarding their greatest need, which is, 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 is for Jesus. Okay, in other words, if you fall into any of those categories, unless you are living on a, alone, on a, stranded on an isolated desert island, and even then, this, you, you can't escape this if you're anything like me, because I'm my worst critic. I, I don't know if that's true for you. By way of illustration, what I want to do in answer to this, you know, how, how am I able to, <clears throat> what approach do I take to, to trying to, to deal with uh, criticism or people's disapproval in the healthiest and the most God-honoring way? I'll just refer uh, to a couple of real-life uh, uh, instances where I was confronted by people and who expressed their disapproval and they did so with no small degree of, of, of passion. And, and I could have um, been moved to that also human reaction to either become on the one hand defensive and angry and just kind of strike back or on the other hand feeling kind of overwhelmed or rejected or rejectable or unloved or whatever, both of which um, are fodder for the enemy of your soul. It's where he's able to work his mischief and, and keep us from the best possible outcome when we have, um, when, we ha when, when people criticize us. When, and it, for fair or unfair reasons, I, I, I think both. It's, it's important to, to respond. And I think that's one of the things I've learned over over the years so that is to appreciate the difference between responding and just reacting. And, and um, in both of these instances, I would say that by God's uh, grace, like you, by, by God's grace, uh, you, can, you can learn to respond in ways that are healthier and more God-honoring because he has given us, if you are a Jesus follower and you've been born again, he's placed his spirit in you. And the Bible says that he's in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure as you cooperate with the spirit. He will empower you 
uh, to, to make the kinds of choices and, uh, that lead to, to life and, and to joy and to perspective. And he's given us his word to instruct us uh, in, in a better way, a life-giving way, the life-giving way of living. So um, I, I think I should qualify before I, I, I give you like three or four, uh, depending on what comes to me here. Um, I, I think I should qualify that in, in both of these encounters, uh, emotions were relatively hot. Uh, there was some misinformation. There was some lack of information. Uh, but there was also some truth that, that I would uh, do myself and those I serve and live with well to consider and to take to heart and to, and to, and to benefit from. And, and I would also say that these people loved Jesus and they didn't have as an agenda uh, their own selfish agenda. They, uh, they might have been a little hot under the collar and may not have been as delicate or thoughtful or careful about how they approached it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they, um, they weren't mal malcontents. That's a whole different deal. Um, I'm not talking about people who are mean-spirited mal malcontents who thrive on just spreading misery, the perpetual, uh, chronic, squeaky wheel that to give attention to uh, would only be to reward um, and give credence to their... And to waste grease, your, your own grease trying to, to placate people who just simply are hard-hearted fools who don't really care about, about you or anything that's, that's good or true or pure. I have zero interest in wasting any energy, renting any space out to such people. Uh, so, so how do I stay um, cool and humble and open to people's... Um, correction or to their rebuke or to their criticism, uh, how, how, do I, how do I do that? Again, I, I would say I, I stop and I think, okay, respond, don't, don't react. And what, what, does, what, does that exactly, uh, what does that exactly look like um, for me? And hopefully you will find that a little bit helpful for you. And I would say that the first thing for me is, is that um, when I find myself in that difficult or, and, and yet important, and, and possibly maybe too heated, overly heated conversation, I, I try to keep in mind, um, I try to keep in mind um, what is it that I'm ulti ultimately after? What is it that, I'm, that I really want? What is, what is the win coming out of, the W-I-N coming out of this encounter? And if you don't know how can you ever win if you don't know what the, what the goal is? And so I ask myself, what is it that I want? What is the win that I want for me? What is the win that I want for this other person? And there are three scriptures that, that help me keep this in mind. One is in James uh, 1, 19 through 20, where he says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Um, so, so let me ask you a question. Have you, ever won, have you ever won an argument and lost a relationship? Yeah, I think probably many of us can, can answer in the, infer, uh, in the affirmative about that. If, if the win for me is to save face, if, if the win for me is to protect my wounded ego, if the win for me is to be, quote, be right, or it's to hurt them back, or it's to deflect owning my own responsibility and legitimate uh, blame, then, then if that's the win, then do just the opposite of what James said to do. Uh, and, and the Spirit of God moving him to tell us that this is how we should approach uh, our relationships. Do just the opposite. And, and it, at the very least, just be honest about it. Say, I'm not interested in a, the best outcome for you and me. I'm interested in saving face. I'm interested in wounding you. At least say it to yourself. And if the Spirit of God is in you, I think that will help motivate you to do what James says here, to pull back on the reins and to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And in so doing, slow to become angry. Then Proverbs 12:16 has meant a lot to me 
in this regard. A fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. And so I think, well, I don't want to be a fool. <laughs> so what's the win for me? I don't want to be a fool. A fool shows his annoyance at once. I don't, uh, I, I, we may have even shown this on a Sunday morning. I'm almost certain that we did a little clip from that show, The Office, where uh, Michael asked uh, one of the other characters on the show, uh, Dwight, I think his name is, he says, what's the most inspiring thing I ever said to you? And he says, you said, don't be an idiot. It changed my life. And then he goes on to say, whenever I think about, whenever, uh, whenever I'm about to do something, I ask, would an idiot do that? He says, and then, uh, it, it, okay, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. That's just what Solomon is saying in Proverbs, right? An idiot shows his annoyance. At once, I don't want to be an idiot. Rather, as he says here, a prudent man. And, and if you are prudent, prudent just means wise. If you're wise, you know what? You'll know if you're wise. You'll know that you have been on the other side of that equation. You have been the one who, who was venting or who was overly harsh or who was overstating your case or who made blanket, blanket, uh, blanketed insults like, you never, I always, you always. We've all done that, right? And then the third one is Proverbs 9, 8, 8 and 9. It says, rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. Instruct a wise man and he'll be wiser still. And so even if, even if someone confronts me and rebukes me and they don't handle it in the most sensitive or even the most biblical way uh, and, and the Bible is, is clear about how to do that speak, speak the truth in love only say those things that are going to be to the benefit of, of the, your listener um, but even if they don't handle that um, as, as, as wisely as they sh should have I still want to walk away wiser, right? Instruct a wise man and it'll be wiser still. Is the goal for me, the goal for you, the goal for me at least, to walk away wiser or walk away more the fool? And, and, that, and that requires, if my goal is to walk away wiser, that I would be slow to speak, except for to speak under my breath in a conversation with God like, Oh, God, help me. <laughs> help me not lose it. Help me, to, help me to listen. Help me to shut my mouth. And then, and then a conversation with myself. Under my breath, what, what is it that I really want? Because at the end, at the end of this encounter, and, and, and it, it will come to an end, will that be more productive or less productive? Will it be, what do I really want? What do I want for them? What do I want for me? And I ask myself that question. And, and then the second thing that, that, that helps me is, and what I, what I said to some of these people, when because I, I listened, I listened, I let them talk. Some of it was venting. Um, you know, there was some passion. There was some heat. Uh, and then when I finally did speak, I said, um, I said something to the effect of, um, I, I know I suck. And I really never wanted this job, which was just simply my, my way of saying, and I went on to enumerate exactly what I meant by that, uh, which was that um, my identity isn't wrapped up in somehow being this perfect performer. And I know that I have areas of incompetence. I know that I am imperfect. And, and so when I say, like, I, I'm, I'm sucky, I, I'm, what I'm not saying is I'm not... I'm not talking about having this attitude of, of self-loathing or self-pity. Yes, I'm a loser. I'm a failure. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I guess I should just go eat worms. It's quite the opposite, actually, when I'm doing it right and doing it well and thinking biblically. It's a posture of humility. And humility isn't groveling. Humility, in the biblical sense, is actually just an honest assessment of, of your strengths and your weaknesses. Really, I mean, at the heart of it. Uh, so, so, for example, in this other occasion, I came to my office and I was greeted with a five-page five page letter uh, that, um, that had a detailed litany um, of, 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 
well, that, of numerous, but a litany would already be numerous, so that would be redundant. And just one more thing for this person to criticize me about, and one of those things was, you can't teach. You, you, you're a sucky teacher. Now, on the other hand, how about that Sunday when I, when, when I was leaving a, a, an older uh, lady, who older, so she knows more, she said to me, she said, uh, you know, you're one of, you're one of, uh, you're one of the, the great preachers of this generation. And I said, well, thank you very much. Later, later that day, I was driving with my wife in the car, and I, I said, uh, uh, Matilda said that I'm one of the great preachers of this generation. And she said, she just kind of nodded her head, mm-hmm, yeah, whatever I said. I wonder, I, I wonder, hun, how many great preachers there are in this generation. She paused for a moment and said, one less than you think. Okay, so that's probably the true assessment, right? Not the best, not the worst. You know, it's just, it's just an honest assessment, you know? So, so when he says you can't, you couldn't preach your way out of a, out of a paper bag, that's okay because my identity doesn't rest on me being able to preach out of a paper bag, but that may not really be especially true, and it may be coming more from a place of heard in his, as in this case, uh, it did. And so why would I take that to heart? Why would I, why would I, other than wanting to try to restore that relationship in the most healthy and helpful way, would I allow that to rent space out uh, in my head? And so... Humility is not just a realistic appraisal of your strengths and weaknesses that, you know, that, that just keeps you kind of um, your feet under you, but it's also understanding that I'm imperfect, that I, that I really am flawed, and I'm a flawed sinner, and I, I, I do some things that I shouldn't do, and I neglect some things that I, shouldn't, uh, that I should do, and, and that, that, it's, that it's a kindness to, to bring that to my attention. And so Psalms 141.5 says, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It's oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. I mean, he, he gets it. Now, when he says, let a righteous man, he did, he's not saying, let a perfect man or let a perfect woman, because there are none. We're all broken. We all are flawed in our own way, in our own ways. And so... If I were to insist on only listening to critiques from, from a fan base of flawless friends, then I would never hear what otherwise would actually be a gift. And that's what it says in Proverbs 25. In the, in the 12th verse, it talks about a rebuke is being like an ornament of gold, being this prized gift that, that you could benefit from if you have the right attitude about it. And so not only am I not without my flaws. The, the people who would bring correction or speak into my life or critique me are not without their, their own. And, and I just, I, I want to be wise enough and humble enough and mature enough um, <clears throat> to eat the meat and spit out the bones. I mean, you almost always have to, right? I mean, who speaks 100% truth in love? And so, God, help me here. You know, is there something here that I can that I can benefit from. Help me to not be defensive or angry. Help me to really hear this. And, and it, you know, remember the story of Balaam? Okay? He was, he was given some really good life-saving advice from a donkey that he finally took, and it served him well. And looking back over the years of my walk with Christ, I have benefited from the input um, and criticism of a few jackasses myself, I must say. And I'm glad that I did. I'm glad that in some cases I wasn't too proud and I wasn't too defensive and I didn't rent a bunch of space out in my head. But I just received it for, for what it was. Um, and, you know, and discredited what was the bones, right? And that isn't to say that people who who bring correction or a rebuke or a criticism somehow bear no responsibility for their, for their motives or for how they deliver it. The Bible is just replete with many, many examples. I referred to one already. 
where the apostle says, I think it's in the book of Ephesians, he says, only speak those things that, are ben that benefit the listener. That it makes me feel better because I was so mad. No, no, that's off limits for you. That's not the wise, mature, Christ-like thing to do. Look at the speck in your own eye and, and think about your own vulnerabilities and failures before you go meddling in other people's lives. Um, it, 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 the, he'll say things like the measure that you use, and he's talking about judgment, will be measured on you. So what, what size, when you're dishing out your criticism, you use a spoon about the size that you would like dished back on you. And do it in a way that, that, that is going to be speaking, as, as we said already, speaking the truth in love so that it has a better chance of being heard and being a benefit to that other person. And another important aspect of biblical humanity, uh, biblical humility, um, I think is important to keep in mind that helps me is that sometimes like that old dopey song, uh, there ain't no good guy, there ain't no bad guy, there's just you and me and we just disagree. I mean, sometimes it's, it's just a disagreement and it's not right or wrong, it's just a, a difference of opinion. But even more importantly, I think is understanding and respecting and celebrating some of those differences because... They're a part of God's genius tapestry of not making us all the same, not wiring us all the same. And if you're a Jesus follower, Rick Warren has this little acronym he uses to help people discover how they've been uniquely shaped by God, to, to discover you know, how they would function at their, their optimum in the body of Christ. And he uses the acronym SHAPE for that. So God gives everyone who's a Jesus follower spiritual gifts, things that, that you're especially um, gifted by God God to make a contribution to the overall health of, of the body. And that's one of the most used metaphors of, 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 the, of the church, is you're like a body, and there's all sorts of different parts uh, of, of the body. And God gifts us that way for a reason. And then the second is heart. You, you, we just have, some of us are, have passions that are different from others. It, you know, some of us have, are really passionate about children or, or youth or, or seniors or, um, you know, prostitutes on the street or the homeless. Or, and your heart just really is moved in, in, in compassion towards, towards those things. And the danger is, is that you can project that onto other people who are wired up a little differently, gifted a little differently, and then you try to make them feel guilty or you criticize them because they don't have the same uh, take on things or the same feeling or heart that that you have. And then uh, the A is for, you know, your natural talents and abilities. Some people are really good in, in music or with numbers or, you know, on and on, and we've got a role. Personality, some of us are loud extroverts and some of us are quiet introverts. And, and then finally he says experiences. And even your painful experiences, uh, they, they shape you. In fact, he would say it this way, and I think it's true. Um, oftentimes it's your most painful experiences in the past that become your your really greatest passion and your most effective ministry that God uses you in. Uh, <clears throat> Skyler, who's been working halftime this last year, he uh, would say it this way, uh, the, um, a euphemism for, for, you know, growing up under-resourced. Uh, I, I grew up on the other side of the tracks. And so he has, he has this real heart, this real passion for, you know, for at-risk kids, and he's been working at a, at a high school that's for at-risk school, and they want to move him into being the principal at, uh, at the at-risk uh, school, and so beginning this coming year, he's going to go full-time into being a principal there. It just, it's God shaped him. Ministry isn't just in church. All of us are called to ministry. Ministry means serving, and and it, and it looks different for different people. And so when people come along, and I know that they're just trying to, they're trying to put me a round peg in a square hole, I, I just, you know, I, I appreciate where they're coming from, and it, you know, I just, that isn't going to work for me. And when I try to do that to other people, I think, like, that's right. You know, God in his genius has made us different, and it's not, um, often it's not right or wrong, it's, it's just different. And you need to appreciate that and even celebrate that, and then, and then I, I would just say lastly here, um, my identity and my, my worth and my security is just far, far too important and valuable for my health and the health of the people that God has called me to love and to serve and my family for me to take and, and rest that on, um, like I said to those people, I didn't want this job when I got it. And by that, I just meant what I'm saying here, position and title 
You know, and those, those things are not what I've built my security and my confidence and my worth on, or nor my performance. You know, so he says, you, you stink at preaching. Well, you know, maybe I do. I didn't want to be a preacher, so fire away. I mean, what am I, how's that going to rent space out in my head is all I was, was my point there. But there, to rest to rest my security and my identity and worth on the opinions of people who, at the beginning of the week, could be people who are shouting Hosanna, and by the end of the week, shouting crucify him. That seems like a pretty tenuous place to build such important things as your security and your identity. And I'll close with these these verses. Galatians 1.10 says, If pleasing people were my goal, what is is the win? What What am I after? If it's just pleasing people, he said, I would not be a servant of Christ. And then 1 Corinthians 4, 2 through 4, I think is so helpful. And would, you would do well if you're an approval addict and, or you really struggle a lot with um, renting space out in your head because, because of people's disapproval. He says, now if, in, in verse um, 2 of 1 Corinthians 4, now it is required that those who have been given a trust, and we've all been given a trust, in, in, in many different ways. And you're going to be accountable to God, so you must prove faithful. And so he says, I, I carry very, very little if I'm judged. And, and he's being judged. People are criticizing him. You're not as good as Apollos or whatever. You know, people just, um, the world is filled with people who would love to rent space out in your head. And he says, I, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. He didn't say, I don't care at all. He's not a uncaring psychopath who doesn't care about people or people's feelings or perspective but he says I keep it in perspective I care very little in fact he says I don't even judge myself my conscience is clear he says but that doesn't make me innocent Um, what does it say in the old testament it says that all a man's ways seem right to him but the lord weighs the heart and so he says even when I think my conscience is clear it doesn't make me innocent it's the lord ultimately who judges me and, and what he's saying here is that this helps me keep things in perspective. It keeps me from going over the edge and becoming angry or bitter or wanting to climb into a hole and, and feeling condemned and, and, uh, and just un, unloved and unvaluable. Here's how I've said it and it, over the year, many, many years now. And it's a kind of a paraphrase of what we just read here in 1 Corinthians 4. And this is my advice. You know, don't take yourself so seriously. But take God very seriously. And I would just say that that has helped. And again, it has served me and those I love and those I serve well to keep that in perspective. I don't take myself all that seriously, so seriously that, that I can't hear criticism. So seriously that I... I build my identity and value and security on on the fickle opinions of men. It helps keep me humble. It helps keep me from feeling like I have to prove myself or defend myself or hurt someone else to feel better. It helps me to love those who are less than, than lovable, to cut us some slack, to cut them some slack, to overlook some of these offenses and harshness, and, and it helps me, and this is why it would be so sad, you know, to, to live out the rest of, of your life as someone who, who rents out a bunch of space in their head and their heart to the approval of others and the opinions of others and the criticism of others. It, it can keep you from really benefiting and being open to correction, being, being teachable, and, and I, I guess if I was going to say a fourth thing, and I'm not because I know you've probably already clicked on, on some other clickbait and, and I'm, not, I'm not talking to anyone, but if I am, the other thing that has really helped me is what it says in the Bible about, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. When I got that five-page letter, I, um, I just went um, straight to the person who wrote it and I said, you know, I'm just going to pretend like I didn't didn't even read any of this. and So tell me just what's going on, what's happening. And, um, you know, and that, that didn't, didn't come, the outcome of that, uh, I'm still working on that, that relationship because 
because they had allowed the sun to set on a lot of bitterness and had you know, some agendas that were probably more selfish than helpful for them. But it didn't keep me up at night. It, it was sad for me because I was sad for them. But it didn't keep me up at night because you know, I, I just did everything I could um, as much as it depended on, on me to have that conversation and to be open to to what they had had to say and that's all I have for you and I would just say this if if this or any of the other posts that that we put on Facebook or Vimeo or YouTube um, have uh, been helpful for you uh, be sure to like click like subscribe or share because I guess that helps people find uh, those things uh, more readily and you can always go to chapel.cc uh, and uh, we have everything posted there, and you can also donate there online. So, Father in heaven, I pray that you would um, give us a heart of wisdom, and, and I pray, God, that you would help us to be a people who, who really do seriously consider what is it when we get into these difficult, heated kinds of conversations and encounters, what is it that we really want for them and want for us, and that, God, our heart would truly be your heart, and that we would want that win that, as it says in your scriptures, that we would make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so help us, help us, I pray. I pray in Christ's good and strong name.